Hi, I'm Matt Pike, a sound designer and composer. In this episode, we'll discuss without a doubt the defining feature of the polybrute, morphing and the expression controls. Within each polybrute preset, there are actually two sounds, part A and part B, with their own settings for all the panel controls and all the modulation amounts in the matrix. Morphing is the ability to move all these panel controls and modulation amounts continuously between those two sounds, allowing for dramatic sonic shifts and the ability to discover unexpected timbres in the ranges between parts A and B. There are several ways of controlling how we morph between those sounds, the most simple being the morph knob, which simply moves everything from part A to part B. This type of interaction goes beyond anything that I've encountered in a polysynth, especially an analog one with so much complexity to begin with. Hats off to the Archeria team for pulling this off because it's truly amazing. Let's take the simple sound I've made and create a part B for it to morph to. With the morph knob fully counterclockwise, we have part A. And when we move it fully clockwise, we have part B, which is currently playing an init preset. It's worth noting before we dive in and start programming that the changes you make to the controls on the panel and the modulation amounts will influence part A and B differently depending on the position of the morph knob. If the morph knob is set fully to part A or B, only that part will be affected by the changes made. But if it's set somewhere in the middle, both parts will get affected. You can always see what the blend of parts A and B you're listening to is by the little fader on the left edge of the screen. With the morph knob set to part B, if we look at the modulation matrix, we'll see that even though the sound we're hearing is just an init patch, there are actually already connections present. These are the connections I made while making part A. They need to remain present in order for the parts to morph properly, but they've had all their amounts set to zero. If we turn off a connection in part B, it'll also be turned off in part A, and vice versa. Right, let's make a sound for part B. I'm going to start with the oscillators. I want something gritty, so I'm immediately going to get some FM going and introduce the sub oscillator. Then as it's pulling the pitch out of tune, I'll increase the sync and try to find a sweet spot around halfway to make the morphing more interesting. Let's bring in oscillator two on the mixer. Again, as we're looking for more variety on the morph, I'm going to use the metalizer. I'll fade back the square on oscillator one to triangle and add some metalizer. I want to create some shifting pitches in the morph, so I'm gonna pitch VCO one up an octave. We can always see if we've gone up an octave because the little LED will go white next to the oscillator. Final thing, let's try and get some movement going on. I'm going to add a subtle amount of LFO to VCO1 tune. I'll use LFO2 so I can add some fade. We can really find some unstable textures thanks to the FM and partial syncing, which I love. So now we have a bright, gritty, modern source sound. Let's cut into it with the filters. Our routing with both oscillators into the Steiner has been copied from part A, which is the default behavior when making patches. I'm gonna stick with this. I'm gonna find a nice notch on the Steiner mode control add some key tracking and get the cutoff resonance and brute sitting nicely. Now I want some more grit on this sound, so I'm gonna crank the VCO2 to Steiner FM. It's brutal, but I love that the synth can get to these places.
To tame it down, we'll make sure the filter routing is in serial and tame the output of the Steiner with the ladder. I'm going to add some filter enveloping to both filters to get a little movement in the grit of the Steiner and also try and get more control and a bit of pluckiness out of that ladder filter. I'm going to add some effects. You'll notice we've got the same algorithms that we had in part A. This is because you can't morph between different algorithms. Finally, I'll crank the stereo spread and add the modulation amounts back in for my performance controls. So that's 12 semitones on the ribbon to get us a nice pitch bend. And we're going to also add 100% on the aftertouch for the vibrato depth. And a little bit on the speed. And we're also going to go 50% on the Z to the modulation amount. Now let's morph it and see what we can find. One final note, the morph knob can be assigned as a destination in the mod matrix. So you can actually use LFOs or envelopes or any other mod source you'd like to control morphing. It could be pretty crazy without planning, but if you build a patch around it, it's pretty cool. Obviously with all the flexibility morphing brings, it can at times get a little bit overwhelming to manage while trying to stay creative programming new sounds. Thankfully, Arturia have included some helpful utilities available by pressing the Morph button by the matrix. The first three of these, Edit A, Edit B, and Edit A plus B, help us to make sure we're always making changes to the part we intended. This is particularly useful when making sounds in layer mode. After these, we have a really creative feature. Pick B allows us to choose not only any other existing preset in the current project, but also choose either of its parts to replace part B of our current sound. For instance, let's try it with that preset we've been using, but we're gonna swap out part B with Brute Embrace. We can see it's currently selected part B of Brute Embrace, if we want to try out part A, we just press it again. If I fancy something different, I can just go exploring through the other options available. This is a trick where finding sweet spots on the macro knob really comes into its element.
Lastly, we have some more utilities for the sound design process. If you've got a sound you like on part A and want to make a more subtle set of morphing behaviors, we can use copy A to B, then tweak the new copy on part B. Current to A or B is a great utility if you find a point part way between parts A and B of the morph knob that you'd like to replace a part with. Finally, if you want to swap the order of the parts, for instance, to get a more satisfying morphy response, or just to swap the lower and upper splits, we have the swap A, B option. Now we have our morphable sound, let's look at the expression controls, which offer us a more inspiring and responsive way to play it. The most important of these is the Morphy. It's a three-dimensional controller in the form of an extremely responsive XY pad mounted on a sprung pressure sensor. The resistance and feedback this Z-axis gives works really nicely to create a connection between the player and the sound. We briefly mentioned the Morphe mode switch in the previous video and how it could be set to follow the modulation matrix assignments. When we switch this to the Morph mode, only the Z-axis still follows those matrix assignments. X and Y now split the controls when morphing across two axes. Y controls any changes to the pitch that occur between part A and part B, and X all other value changes. <laughs> By doing this, we open up so many more variations from a single preset. We also have a responsive, tactile way of exploring them. Whether you're looking for expressive control over big dramatic changes or subtle nuances in timbre, the combination of morphing and the morphe makes this incredibly intuitive. Along with the Morphe, we have several other performance controls which we can use to get the most out of patches on the Polybrute. The pitch bend and mod wheel sit above the octave switches and Morphe. It's great having these classic controllers available for more familiar keys playing. The other main performance controller is the ribbon controller, just above the keyboard. This is a bipolar continuous touch controller which can be assigned via the matrix to any parameter. The classic use of a ribbon like this is to assign it to a pitch bend. We're also able to change the behavior of the ribbon in the settings menu. To access it quickly, hold the settings button and tap the ribbon. We have four options for the ribbon. Tap is the default behavior, it's absolute, and when we lift our finger off, the value instantly returns to zero. Hold is also absolute. However, when we lift our finger, that value is then held until we next touch the ribbon. This can be great for filter sweeps and effects. Scan is a relative mode. This is very helpful when using the ribbon as a pitch controller, as it allows for more comfortable playing without causing jumps in pitch. Slow scan is the same as the previous mode, but it adds a smooth transition back to zero, which can sound more musical and make playing easier. These same four modes are also available for the Morphe controller. Its menu is accessed in the same way, hold settings, press the Morphe. The final expression control I'd like to look at is the motion control, which allows you to record yourself physically tweaking one control of the synth, 
then play it back every time a key is pressed. To demonstrate this, we use the same preset we've been using so far. First, we need to record a motion. We do this by pressing the record arm button, then playing and holding a single note while tweaking the desired control. The recording will stop when we lift our finger, and we can turn off record arm mode. Now that we're done, we can choose the play mode of the recording. We can either play it back as an envelope with once, or an LFO with loop. The playback is polyphonic, meaning the motion always sounds interesting when it's played as chords. The speed of the playback can also be adjusted via the rate knob. The playback rate is selected as stepped ratios, which is really helpful for keeping modulations in time. This recorder can be used to record up to 10 minutes of motion. Of course, that 10 minutes could then also be slowed down even further, so have fun, drone heads. A couple of final things to note about the recorder. It can be used to record not only the synth voice controls, but also the performance controllers, like the ribbon or the Morphe. And when we use it to record the Morphe, it even records all three axes. If that wasn't enough, the modulation rate can even be set as a modulation destination. For me, this is where we reach nearly limitless potential in terms of modulation capabilities on this synth. All right, that's it for this episode. Hopefully that's helped demystify morphing a little and got you excited about the creative potential this machine has when we combine the expressive controllers and the powerful morphing features. In the next episode, we'll be looking at the effect section which can be used to add either a subtle touch of class to a sound or as a creative tool to make incredible hybrid modern sounds. Thanks for watching. Check out the links below for more info.